Inspired by a falling out between a legendary rock star and his punk rock girlfriend, this song tells the tale of two lovers facing a fate worse than death. And though it was a, a no-show on the Billboard Hot 100, it has gone on to become one of its band's signature songs, and a legendary band at that. Even today, decades later, it still subverts all our expectations, uh, taking us to a place of utter disbelief. So get ready for an in-depth breakdown of a breakup song about one of history's most famous couples, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey Music Junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to spend hours upon hours creating the perfect mixtape for that special someone who probably didn't know you existed, you really should subscribe below right now. You're gonna dig this channel, the story straight from the legends. We also have a Patreon that you're gonna need to check out as well, cool stuff that you won't find anywhere else. So today we're covering a song that sounds just as good in the 2020s as when it was released back in the 1980s. It's a song that is just fantastic. It's Romeo and Juliet by Dire Straits. The British rock band Dire Straits formed in London in 1977, and their original lineup consisted of Mark Knopfler on lead vocals and lead guitar, his brother David on rhythm guitar, John Ilsley on bass, and Pick Withers on drums. In 1978, they released their self-titled debut, which included the singles Water of Love. Yes, I need a little water of love. And Sultan's a Swing. With a Sultan's a Swing. In 1979, they released their follow-up, Communicate, put out the singles Lady Rider. And Once Upon a Time in the West. Now for their third album, Dire Straits traveled to New York and they set up shop at a studio called The Power Station, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, they got to work on June 20th, 1980. The album was called Making Movies and it was co-produced by Mark Knopfler and Jimmy Iovine, who had been the engineer and mixer on Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. Due to his connection, Iovine was able to secure E Street Band uh, keyboardist Roy Bitten for the sessions, the professor. Uh, it was the first time the band had ever fully worked a keyboardist into its lineup, but Knopfler's arrangements were expanding musically and uh, getting more complex, and Bitten was just the man for the job. <laughs> Going into the studio, Mark Knopfler had written a lineup of great songs. There was Tunnel of Love, Tunnel of love. which uh, Springsteen would have a song of the same name a few years later. In this tunnel of love. There was Skate Away. She's making movies on location. Expresso Love. Romeo and Juliet. I love struck Romeo. Sing the streets of Serenade. There was a sense within the group that this album was going to be something very special. But for all the promise on the horizon, Dire Straits' increasing success had exhausted one of its members, Dave Knopfler. Uh, more than anyone else in the band, he was struggling. And if the intense march to fame and fortune uh, wasn't hard enough, Dave was also. Uh, having the challenge of, uh, the distinct challenge, really, of living in the shadow of his brother, Mark, who was the undisputed leader of the band. Through the first few weeks of recording, Dave's dissatisfaction felt like uh, a dark cloud over, over the recordings. And it really followed him wherever he went. With eyes averted to the floor, he and Mark had all but stopped talking. And the resentment and gloom was dragging everybody down. Now, it all came to a head one day when Dave showed up to the studio empty-handed. Responsible for a fairly simple guitar part on Romeo and Juliet, Dave just hadn't bothered to practice it. So Iovine told him, you know, go away and learn it and come back. But when Dave came back the next day, he still couldn't play it. Until now, Mark had held his tongue, but this was all that he could stand, and he really let his brother have it right then and there. From there, an argument exploded, and Dave left the studio. The rest of the band agreed that Dave really wasn't pulling his weight. 
It was time for an ultimatum. John Ilsley volunteered to break the news. He met Dave at Central Park and there with a heavy heart, he laid it all out. He said, you know, there are two ways to resolve this. Come back to the studio, bury the hatchet with Mark, or you go home. After only a month into the recording, Dave Knopfler chose to go home. The band was stunned to say the least, but at Iovine's urging, they got back to work and session guitarist Sid McGinnis, he was brought in to fill the void. Though this wasn't how they wanted it to end up, the band felt uh, really a tangible sense of relief thereafter. Dire Straits returned to London at the end of August 1980, and they had to move fast. The American leg of the on-location tour, as it was dubbed, it was just seven weeks out, and they still needed a guitarist and a keyboard player. The following month, the band auditioned guitarist Hal Linz and keyboardist Alan Clark. Both did make the cut, and Making Movies was released on uh, October 17, 1980, and it was almost universally well-received. Clocking in at 37 minutes, 39 seconds, it is made up of just seven tracks. But you get a lot of bang for your buck because this is one of the straight's most masterful albums. No question. Making Movies, it actually peaked at number four in the UK charts and included the single Skate Away and Tunnel of Love, and today's featured song, Romeo and Juliet. And I dream your dream for you, and now your dream is real. As we break down this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Right now, Zenny is having their spring fling, where you can get 30% off of lenses and coatings. You can save on a wide variety of lenses, tints, and coatings. Just type in the promo code SPRINGFLING22. I do it quickly because the sale does end on April 17th, but go to zenny.com today and you can do that. Now, when John Ilsley first heard Mark Knopfler play him Romeo and Juliet, he thought uh, if the rest of the album sounds like this, it's going to be very promising. Mark had come over to John's house, guitar in hand, and he wanted him to play a song about a failed love affair. Apparently, this was something most of the band could relate to at that time. According to manager Ed Bicknell, he said, there were issues with various band members that related mostly to the girls in their lives, the women in their lives, and they were uh, really on edge. He said, we went into that record off the back of three out of four of them going through uh, pretty rough breakups. But for John, when Mark started plucking those first chords and he started singing, it was an instant high. knew that this song was something very special. Bicknell had practically the same experience when he first heard the song. He said, I remember Mark coming into the office and playing it for me for the first time. I didn't know what to say. I just sat and stared at the ground in complete disbelief. I would bet there's a good chance a lot of you had uh, that same reaction as well. This song, I tell you, it, uh, it glides along eloquently. Over six minutes of pure heartbreaking perfection. He's underneath the window, just singing, hey, lie, my boyfriend's back. You know, John had watched uh, Mark struggle through a devastating breakup, but I don't think he expected anything like this to come out of it. Honestly, he was astonished that Knopfler could produce something so beautiful while feeling so very low. But then he realized. That uh, it was only because Mark's soul was so agitated that this song was even possible. Romeo and Juliet was inspired by a very specific girl. Her name was Holly Beth Vincent. So up front, I, I got to tell you that uh, the public details about Mark and Holly's relationship, pretty sparse. Uh, Mark, of course, is incredibly private. He hasn't said much about it. And though there are a few sources we can draw from, most of them from Holly's perspective, uh, but from what's available, I think we can put together the basic narrative what inspired the song. We want to leave them to their privacy, but uh, it does go into the song. Uh, like Mark Knopfler, Holly was a musician, and she'd been one from a young age. Uh, she was initially interested in drumming and lived in California for a while. Now, shortly before turning 18, she moved to London, where she lived with Chris Wood from Traffic and his wife, Jeanette. There she auditioned as a drummer and met various British musicians, including Mark Knopfler. Now, according to Holly, she, along with her bass player, had placed an ad for a guitarist in the Melody Maker. That's how they did it back in the day. Uh, this guy, Mark Knopfler, showed up, she said. He liked, uh, you know, liked me. He was an English teacher at the time. But by 1978, Holly's stint in the UK was over, and she was back in America. 
After touring with some Midwest bar bands, she began drumming for the rockabilly outfit Brothel Creepers. Great name. Next, she picked up the guitar and started singing for the all-female uh, punk band Backstage Pass, is what they were called. But soon Holly opted to form her own band, which she called Holly and the Italians. They put together a demo tape, and when Knopfler passed through California in uh, 1979, I believe, with Dire Straits, he gave it a listen. He liked what he heard, and he played it for his manager, Ed Bicknell. The next thing Holly knew, she and her drummer Steve Young were packing their bags for England with the promise of signing a record deal there. Though it wasn't her only offer at the time, she pursued it because of her relationship with Mark Knopfler. But instead of getting her a deal, Holly said that Bicknell brought us to England and left us there. But not all was lost. While in the UK, Knopfler introduced Holly to BBC DJ and Oval Records owner Charlie Gillette. Uh, he put the band under contract for a single and they recorded Tell That Girl to Shut Up for Oval. The single became a minor hit as it climbed the British charts and it made enough noise that Holly and the Italians soon after signed a deal with Virgin Records. Now sometime during the rise of Holly's band, she and Mark had a falling out. And uh, although, like I said, details about the romance are very scant, we do at least know that Romeo and Juliet was influenced by uh, that uh, falling out. In fact, Holly said almost the entire Making Movies album was either written about her or their separation. The lyrics of Knopfler's Romeo and Juliet describe an ill-fated relationship, let's say. But unlike Shakespeare's tell, these two lovers don't die from poison uh, or the thrust of a dagger. Rather, I would argue this star-crossed romance ends in a far worse tragedy. Total and complete estrangement. Awkward. Knopfler enlists Romeo to tell the tale for us, or to us. As the song progresses, our hero recounts to Juliet all they've been through and pleads for their love affair to continue. But Juliet, for her part, isn't interested in revisiting the past or making Romeo a part of her future. I have to say, how Knopfler framed this song is nothing short of, of genius. Just by referencing Shakespeare's famous characters, Romeo and Juliet, he immediately sets the bar for our expectations. Because as listeners, we are expecting two things. You know, first, we fully expect this couple to be madly in love with each other. And then second, in the back of our brains, we're asking ourselves, don't Romeo and Juliet you know, die in the end? But Knopfler doesn't give us either one of these assumptions that we have. Yes, Romeo is madly in love. However, Juliet could care less. And all I do is miss you. And the way we used to be. Though a tragic ending awaits, it is in no way as satisfying as the, the grave sacrifice Shakespeare's lovers make in play. Perhaps this may come as a surprise to anyone unfamiliar with Mark's uh, failed love affair with Holly, but Juliet is cast as the villain here. I mean, sure, the love-struck Romeo can't see it, or maybe he just doesn't care, but she's not the same girl that he first fell in love with. Regardless, throughout the song, he fights to win his lover back. You know, he pulls out all the stops, serenading her, professing his love to her, regaling her with memories of their time together. And he even overlooks some pretty harsh offenses. You promised me everything. You promised me thick and thin, yeah. All Romeo wants is Juliet. As he opens the first verse, Knopfler sets the stage with a love-struck Romeo singing a love song in the streets. And right away, we know who he is seen to. Even before we hear her name, as he finds a streetlight and steps out of the shade, he calls up to her, you and me, babe, how about it, you know? Something like, you and me, babe, how about it? With Juliet up in the window, we think we know, you know what's coming. After all, this is a nod to the Shakespeare classic balcony scene where she and Romeo confess her love. Oh, Romeo, Romeo. However, the cold words that come out of Juliet's mouth aren't the response that uh, we're expecting or that Romeo was hoping for. Reprimanding him, she says, you shouldn't come around here singing up at people like that. You shouldn't come around here singing up at people like that. Physically and emotionally out of reach, she just taunts him. Anyway, what are you going to do about it? Anyway, what you going to do about it? 
And here we get our first hint that the, the fates are not in Romeo's favor. Knopfler then transitions into the chorus, and this is where Romeo reaches a point of high passion. He cries, Juliet, the dice was loaded from the start, and I bet when you exploded into my heart. Singing about loaded dice and how the time was wrong, Knopfler's Romeo laments the power that fate has on his relationship with Juliet. And from this, we can guess that this couple is not getting back together. However, Romeo doesn't care. Loaded dice or not, he's a hopeless romantic and he can't help feeling the way that he feels. As the tale just continues, Romeo remembers when he and Juliet were just starting out. Both came from the, the mean and dirty streets of shame. On different streets, they both were streets of shame. Both the May have been a tough road, but at least their, their dreams were the same. This flashback is a likely reference to how Mark and Holly were, you know, scratching their way to success as starving musicians. Knopfler in the guise of uh, Romeo sings, I dreamed your dream for you, and now your dream is real. This could very well be an allusion to how he helped Holly's band get signed, and then in one of the most heart-wrenching lines of the entire song, uh, Romeo cries out in disbelief, how can you look at me as I was just another one of your deals? How can you look at me as if I was just another one of your deals? Romeo feels like he's been used by Juliet. Was he only a means to an end? A discarded deal maker? An incidental figure in her life? It's just bitter to the taste. Not just for Romeo, but for the rest of us as listeners. How could Juliet not want Romeo anymore? It's always the question we have when you're listening to these songs or watching the movies. Coming into the second verse, Romeo laments Juliet's fall from grace. You know, falling for chains of silver and gold. She has imprisoned herself to the promises of pretty strangers and uh, cast aside the prize of their relationship. You can fall for chains of gold. You can fall for pretty strangers. Romeo reminds Juliet that she promised him everything. She promised him thick and thin. The wording, uh, reminiscent of a marriage vow, implies that no matter what happened, they would be there for each other, almost certainly. It also implies that he promised her the same. So now here he is, uh, keeping his promise, trying to win her back. But her callous response is, oh, Romeo, yeah, I know I used to have a scene with him. Yeah, you just say, oh, Romeo, yeah, you know, I used to have a scene with him. I mean, did their promises mean nothing to Juliet? What's even worse though, Knopfler actually lifted this line from an interview that Holly gave after she broke up with him. Uh, when asked about her relationship with Mark, she said, what happened was that I had a scene with Mark Knopfler and it got to the point where he couldn't handle it and we split up. The second time the chorus comes around, Knopfler adds a variation, giving us insight into how close the couple uh, was or were. Juliet, when we made love, you used to cry. You said, I love you like the stars above. I'll love you till I die. After that, Knopfler uses the line, there's a place for us, you know the movie song. That reference is the opening line of the song Somewhere. It was featured in West Side Story. Somewhere a place for us. I mean, it's a galvanizing moment because, of course, West Side Story was based on Romeo and Juliet. Now, in verse 3, Romeo wonders if he just didn't do enough to win Juliet's heart. He sings, I can't do a love song like the way it's meant to be. And I can't do a love song like the way it's meant to be. Or maybe he is wondering if the song isn't enough. Regardless, he's not ready to let her go. I can't do everything, but I'd do anything for you. I can't do anything except be in love with you. As the verse closes out, Knopfler returns again to the symbols of stars as fate. When Romeo cries, Juliet, I'd do the stars with you anytime. Juliet, do the stars with you anytime. We know that he'd do it all over again even for the same outcome. By the end, Romeo comes full circle to where the song began. Once again, we find him serenading in the streets with a love song that he made. The song ends on something of a cliffhanger. 
though I'd argue that by now we are supposed to understand how it will end. And Romeo says something like, you and me, babe, how about it? You and me, babe, how about it? We hope that uh, his impassioned pleading has been enough. And we hope that Juliet will let Romeo climb up to her window so that they can start again. But as the song fades into silence, we can't ignore what has been uh, written in the stars in the song or in Mark Knopfler's real-life drama. Juliet isn't taking Romeo back. So with a wounded but resilient heart, our protagonist fades into the silence. And though we hope beyond hope that it isn't true, we do take solace in the knowing that at least Romeo will always love her and he did everything he could. Dire Straits, they made a video for Romeo and Juliet in addition to two others from the album. There was Tunnel of Love and Skate Away. All three were directed by Lester Bookbinder and sold on VHS as a compilation called Make It Movies. MTV went on the air a year after that. They were too long, probably too slow and cerebral for the young I Want My MTV audience. I can't do the talk, so let the talk on the TV. Romeo and Juliet, it was released as a single on January 9th, 1981. It went to number eight in the UK and it was certified platinum there. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, it's been featured in several movies and TV shows. It should be in more. It was in Empire Records in 95. I love struck Romeo, sing the streets of serenade. Can't Hardly Wait in 98, 200 Cigarettes in 99. Hot Fuzz in 2007, Brothers and Sisters, The Goldbergs. This is us, I Tanya. Laying everybody low. He was really sweet in the beginning. And Goliath. It's also been covered by the Indigo Girls. Juliet says, hey, it's Romeo. He nearly gave me a heart attack. Yeah, well. That was in 92. Edwin McCain did it in 2003. Came up on different streets. The both of streets of shame. And the Killers have a cool version, 2007. for pretty strangers and the promises they hold. I don't have a doubt in my mind that uh, director Rob Reiner was influenced by the, the quirky romantic genius of this beautiful pop lament when he tapped Mark Knopfler to create the score for the 1987 classic, The Princess Bride. Bye, bye, bye. Have fun storming the castle. The Princess Bride, rated PG. Reiner has said that only Knopfler could create a soundtrack to capture the film's uh, quirky yet uh, romantic nature. Reiner was an admirer of Knopfler's work, but didn't know him before working on the film. He sent the script to him, hoping that he'd agree to score the film, and he did. A storybook story, but it's as real. Though in the case of The Princess Bride, Romeo did get his Juliet in the end. As you wish. Oh, my sweet Wesley. In the song, it just didn't happen. So life doesn't always imitate art. Leave us a comment about Dire Straits and this incredible song, Romeo and Juliet. What are your memories of the song? What are your feelings? What do you think the song means? Let us know below. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our coverage on other Dire Straits songs, including Sultan's Swing, uh, which we'll link to below. And if you dig our content, make sure that you subscribe below so that you never miss out on our videos. And we'd love to have you as part of this community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.